Thank you, Brad. I appreciate very much you and the worship team leading us to remember the goodness of God. I don't know about you, but when we start singing that, my cup just starts overflowing, thinking about all the good that I've experienced in my life. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about a rich and satisfying life, an overflowing kind of life where our cup runs over. And so, let me just define that as we begin. It's, it's simply this, to be filled beyond capacity with an endless supply of God's goodness. To be filled beyond capacity with an endless supply of God's goodness. A rich and satisfying life. We're looking at John 10, beginning with verse 1. We're going through verse 10. It's on 891 in that Black Pew Bible. If you don't have a copy of your own, I invite you to turn there. Otherwise, turn to your own. We're going to stand up in just a minute, Casey. Hold on there, okay? And we're going to look at that in just a second. As we do, uh, before we do, we know there are certain things that rob us of that rich and satisfying life. A lot of times, it's conflict. Maybe you've heard the story about the preacher Baptist preacher and the city manager who were in great conflict. They were always at one another, always uh, arguing about different things that were going on in the community. And one day, uh, there was a donkey that died in the church parking lot. And uh, the, the pastor, the preacher, calls the city manager and, and says, uh, hey, I'd like for you to move the, the, the donkey, except the pastor uses the biblical language and he says, I'd like for you to remove the jackass out of our parking lot. I cleared this with the deacon, by the way, beforehand. And, and so that's what he, he said. And, the, and the city manager said, well, why are you calling me? I thought it was your job to bury the dead. And the pastor said, well, I just I, that's true. It is my job to bury the dead, but I always try to inform the next of kin before I do. Conflict is not a good thing in a rich and satisfying life. In this particular passage of Scripture in John 10, we're going to be looking at the contrast between the, the thief and, and the one who came that we might have a rich and satisfying life. The good shepherd, the gate, the door of the sheepfold. And so as we look at that together, would you stand now, Casey, in honor of the reading of God's Word. John 10, beginning with verse 1, we're reading from the New Living Translation. John 10, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Did anything Jesus ever say not the truth? We can trust this. It's in red letters if you have that red letter edition of the, of the Scripture. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. And they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration or this figure of speech didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I'll tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. 
Maybe you know it in a different version. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I've come that you might have life, Jesus says, and have it more abundantly. Oh, Father, teach us what that life's like. Because, Father, we, we desperately need it because our world desperately needs it. There's brokenness at every turn. Brokenness in families. Brokenness in our society. In our government. Lord, we thank You for the healing that has come. We thank You, Lord, for the way you, You're working among us in our day. And Lord, we thank You for the the redemption and the restoration that You've brought and are going to bring. And we trust, Lord, that You'll do that through Your people. So help us, Lord, to understand more of what this abundant life, this overflowing life, this rich and satisfying life is all about. So that we can experience it and we can pass it on. In your holy, precious name, we pray. Amen. Keep your Bibles open for just a second. I want to just explain a few things before we look at what that life is all about a little closer. You also might want your bulletin. We're going to cover some of that in, in just a moment. As we look at this section, though, we know Jesus is using a figure of speech or an illustration. He's comparing himself to the good shepherd, or he says, I am the gate. What is that all about? How in the world do we understand that? I don't know if you know anything about sheep. I don't know anything about sheep. Remember, I'm from Hereford. I know about cows. I know about cattle. But there's some similarities. A sheepfold is like a cattle corral. You know, you remember those old Western movies. Some of you are old enough to remember those old livery stables. Well, in that day, there were kind of sheepfolds in the community and all the sheep would be gathered in in a community sort of sheep pen and <clears throat> they would all be thrown in there, there together and how would you know and whose sheep were whose how would they distinguish themselves and here's what would happen the shepherd as he was out in the field with his specific flock of sheep he talked to them He'd call them by name, usually according to their characteristics. Like he'd say, hey, there's, hey, old long nose, how you doing over there? Hey, old black ear, how, how, hello, fluffy, how are you doing over there? You know, and he'd talk to them in a sing-song kind of way, and they'd, they'd hear his voice, and they'd know him. And there was a familiarity and, a, and an intimacy with the shepherd and the sheep. And so when they all gathered, they would know uh, the, the shepherd's voice. And, and what he's talking about here is that he was the, the gate. What would happen in that sheepfold, there would be a gatekeeper, but when the, those sheep and that shepherd would go out in the country, they'd have a different sort of sheepfold, made, usually made by rocks and sticks and bricks and all, I mean, all whatever they could find out there to, to kind of hem them in at night so he could keep a better watch on them. And there'd be no gate. And he would be the gate. The shepherd would lie down at the gate and so there was no going in or going out. There was no wolves or predators or, or thieves or robbers going in uh, without him, them crossing the provision and the protection of the shepherd. There was no sheep escaping. There was no sheep wandering without the shepherd's knowledge. It's such an intimate sort of relationship if you would think about it that way. As the Lord is our shepherd, as we looked at a few weeks ago, in Psalm 23, it, it makes it a lot more personal. We know God knows what we are going through. Wherever we are. Whatever faces us. Whatever we're struggling with. God knows. And we know that we can hear from God about that and that we can, can follow and that we can experience the life that He intended for us to experience. And so we focus on verse 10 in this passage. As I was reading through this this week, I was just 
um, amazed at how God had provided and protected me through my life. And many of you in, in life groups this morning shared your testimony. I want to do that in just two minutes or less because uh, I'm learning to do that. Preston Mitchell can share his with you anytime you want because he's going on our trip. All of our, our mission team, he's got it on his phone right there. He'll read it to you in no time at all. And so if you want to hear Preston's testimony, just, Preston, would you be at, in the foyer afterwards? At, and you, nah, I'm just kidding, Preston. We're going to hear that, though. And, and I want you to hear mine for just a moment. Because I want you to be able to share yours and what the Lord has done for you, too. Now, I, you remember, I grew up in a home without a dad. My father was killed when I was two years old. And I had an older brother, older sister. They were seven and they were five. And I have a younger brother. He was one. And my mother, oh, saint that she was, raised three boys and a girl by herself. And one of the things she did, made sure she did, she, she took us to church all the time. And one of the things that was so attractive to me about this church, it was like the church I grew up in because men in that church, like men in this church, cared about children, cared about others. And we have such a great group of deacons in this place. And they do. They reach out. I see them every week. They're giving them lollipops or they're shaking their hands or they're calling them names. I mean, friendly names, nicknames kind of sort of thing. And, and I just appreciate so much that they love. I grew up in a place like that. We were there all the time. I was vacation Bible school, Sunday school, all this stuff. But you know what? I was a greedy, angry, selfish little kid. We had these meetings. You remember, some of you remember these kind of meetings, and we called them revivals. Anybody know what a revival is? You know, you had these revival meetings in, in, a, in Temple Baptist Church in Hereford, Texas on Avenue K. I can still see it. We, we'd had these hellfire and brimstone preachers when I was a kid. And I had the hell scared out of me when I was eight years old. I knew I didn't want to go there. And I knew I was headed there. Because I was selfish and greedy and angry. God got a hold of me in that meeting and I remember coming down the aisle and I was crying knowing I was going to hell. And the preacher said, hey, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, He can save your soul. And I have no doubt that was 35 years ago. Whoops, 45 years ago I lost a whole decade when I was 8 years old. And it took, and it happened because of a group of people that love like this group of people. Love children. But I didn't know how to walk with God. I didn't know how to have a relationship with Him. I didn't know how to be a sheep. Him be my shepherd. I learned that later on through the influence of a youth minister. In fact, his name was Randall Stotts. His son and grew up in Blue Springs, Missouri. That's where Randall is now. He was the best man in my wedding. And now his son is the youth pastor at First Baptist Church in Seminole. you believe that? God did that. God worked all the, the details out of life. In fact, that's my life verse. A lot of things happen like that in my life. God works all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. In Romans 8, 28. So God put that guy in my life, even though he wasn't the youth pastor at my church. He was the youth pastor at First Baptist Church in Hereford. And we built a relationship and he taught me how to walk with Jesus and he helped me in my calling in the ministry and he still helps me to this day to discern what God is, is helping or telling me. He helps me discern that. About that time, I, I realized, you know, not only are those pastors and those deacons influenced my life and I want to be like them, but coaches we got a couple of those guys here. They were such a big impact on my life because I love sports. So I, I decided, even though I was called at 15 at a youth camp of all things in Glorietta to be a, in the ministry, I decided I was going to be a teacher and a coach like my older brother was. I went to school uh, for that, and I became a, a, a math teacher. Dagazon hired me as a math teacher in Denver City in 1991 for one semester. Uh, that's all they could take me, and that's all. No, Actually, Jennifer and I were engaged at the time. I needed a job. I was going to support a new wife, so that was the job I had. And I was headed to seminary. Alan Cornelius, some of you would know that name. He used to be the 
the head football coach and the athletic director, offered me a coaching job after I got that math teaching job. And I was going to take it because it paid really well. And I wanted to, to be in this place. And I said, well, you know, Alan, I was going to seminary. I'm getting married. I'm going to seminary. But I, I think I want that job. And he said, Kyle, you're going to seminary? I'm not getting in the way of that. Forget that job offer. You don't have a job offer anymore. And he rescinded it, so I went to seminary. I told him many times since then. I know Alan a little bit now. He's the reason I'm still in ministry today. Because God shut that door that way. God used people like that. And God used, at about that time when I decided I was going to be a math teacher and a coach, God, God hooked me up with this young lady that at Wayland Baptist University. And she was going to be a preacher's wife. So I decided I was going to be a preacher. <laughs> Not really. I decided before I got it called me before that. But she helped me and loved me and encouraged me. She sits on this front row every day. That was that's been 31 plus years ago now. That's my story. And and we've served got to serve churches together in Bay City, Missouri, and and Olton, Texas, and Crockett and Hereford and now Denver City. And it just gets better. It's just this rich and satisfying life, right, Jim? Yeah. Even me, right? I get better. You think of that? I'm like a fine wine, a good cheese. I just get better with age, don't I? And let's go on. That's it. God did it. God did it. He's changed me from that greedy, selfish little boy. Now, I still got a lot of room to grow. You know that full well. But I'm working on being humble. I'm working on being generous. I'm working on being Loving and unselfish. Thanks for letting me. Thanks for helping us. And that's my story. We've all got that story. I've had stories multiplied by stories, multiplied by stories in the churches I've been able to be a part of. You got a story. You share that story with people. Now here, here's why I tell you all of that, because I was I was thinking about this passage and how important it was to me. That the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I've come that you might have life. And have it rich and satisfying, full, abundant. What does that mean? How is that expressed? Well, when I was pastoring in Hereford, I, I used to go visit folks in the care center. It's called King's Manor up in Hereford. And one of these ladies I visited was a lady named Faye Rogers. And Faye, I didn't know this story until later on, and I did her funeral. Her family shared this with me. But, but Faye Rogers was such a good and godly, godly woman. I have a picture of her son, who was a very dear friend of mine, who was a, a history teacher. And, and you can see him. He, sh he shared that with me this week as I talked to him. His name was Joe D. I didn't even know his name was Delbert until the, he sent that. Joe Delbert Rogers. He was a long-time history professor and started teaching over at WT, and he got his master's degree this last, this last time. He's 73 years old, and he got a master's degree. Can you believe that? Unique individual. His mother, though, was much of the reason why he was who he was. And I thought about this passage with her. Because the story is, 520 Avenue I, right across the park, she was at home, dark, in her house there, and a thief comes breaking in the back window. I mean, that's kind of everybody's greatest fear. It's not just little old ladies who fear that. I'm scared to death when Jennifer's out of town. I, I, I really am. I don't like to be in my house by myself. He came crashing through. He's strung out on drugs. The thief that came to steal and kill and destroy. You know what Faith Rod, Faye Rogers did? She shared the one who came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Instead of freaking out and panicking, she's in her 80s. She starts to talk to the young man and starts to witness to the young man. And he calms down and he comes off of his high and he listens. And he calls the police on himself. 
And they come and get him. And we don't know that he was ever converted, but I tell you this, he had a witness. What kind of person does that? Someone who knows the protection and the provision of the Good Shepherd. Of the Good Shepherd. The one who came that we might have life. Now let's think about that for just a moment. Look at, at that passage again, especially verse 10 with me if you would. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that you might have life. Verse 10 in the New Living Translation says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And sometimes we think the thief is somebody, somebody else. If you ever been violated by someone who's broken into your home, you know how um, difficult it is to go back to that place for a period of time. How scary it is. And, and you think somebody might be there. But there are other things thieves in our lives that steal our peace and our joy. And I want you to think about them for just a moment. You got an overbearing boss or difficult co-workers. You got an in-law or an outlaw in your family or somebody that you just think are, it's, it's, they, I just wish they weren't part of our gathering when we have some, so much fun together. It's just harsh or hard or do you have um, any anybody who's just hard to get along with and steals your peace and your joy? Do you have anybody in your in your life that that kills your soul, makes you not want to forgive, that that kills your your spirit, makes you not want to be joyful? Do you have anybody in your life that that destroys? Your attitude that destroys your life. We think of oftentimes other people. And, and that's what Jesus is referring to as thieves and robbers who, who jump over into the sheepfold, who don't enter by the door. There, there are other kinds of people. The thief was the person who would would break into the home, the robber, the one who would, would attack the wayfair, the person on the road. But then it comes to verse 10 and says, the thief, the thief, the purpose of the thief is to steal and kill and destroy. When your, your children or your siblings are squabbling with you, here's, here's something I... I learned from a dear sweet lady in a former church. She always said this when her grandkids were arguing. Identify the enemy. And it's not your brother. It's not your sister. It's not uh, your, your parents. It's not even your kids. It's the thief. The father of life. The roaring lion roaming around seeking someone to devour. There is an enemy we have and his name is Satan. It's the evil one. He and his purpose is to destroy, deceive, to steal and kill and ruin your life. We see evidence all around us, don't we? Sometimes it's Seems like he's winning. Doesn't it? Don't stop reading. Don't stop thinking about the rest of that verse. Because Jesus says, I've come that you might have life. Or my purpose is that I give you Full and satisfying, a rich and satisfying life. What does that look like? Well, I'm going to share one thing that uh, Jonathan Pokluda shared, and I, I, I said this last week, but I want it on the screen so you can see it. The Christian life is this journey of, of learning over and over again that life cannot be found in possessions, experiences, progression, or achievement, but ultimately and only. In Christ alone. 
Because our world, our culture says that the abundant life, the high life, is all about how much stuff we have. Or how much, what, what kind of salary we earn. Or, or what kind of experience we can experience. What kind of vacation can we take? What kind of, what kind of pleasures can we experience? What kind of trips or or travel, or or whatever. Nothing wrong with any of that. Hear me say that. But so often we exchange the blessings of God and become obsessed in pursuing those things. God might bless us that way. But is that all we think about? Is that all of our attention and affection? If it is, then, then those things have become idols to us. It's not in the progression. It's not how healthy we are psychologically or, or emotionally or it's not the education that we achieve that causes a abundant life or brings about the full and rich and meaningful and satisfying life. It's not any kind of achievement or awards. We, we can go to state and track or, or we can go to the one act play state finals and be the best voted the best and most outstanding actor or we can win the volleyball state championship or we can do any number of things to rise in our accomplishments and achievements. But you know what? It doesn't last. Possessions and achievements and progression and all of that stuff. We always have to have more and more and more and more because the full, the rich, the meaningful, the abundant, the satisfying life is found in relationships. The relationships we have with one another, our family, we have all the money in the world. What good is it if we don't have anyone to share it with? We'd be old and cranky and grumpy. By the way, if, if the Lord called us by our characteristics, and he calls us out as a shepherd calls a sheep. What would our name be? Would it, would it be grumpy? Someone says, I, do you wake up grumpy in the morning? I say, no, I let her sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, she's got lots of great characteristics, but the morning is not one of them. You think about what he would call us. Would he call us angry or selfish or greedy or... Fearful or anxious if He called us by name according to our characteristics. Praise the Lord that He doesn't call us that way. And praise the Lord He does call us and that's the first thing I want you to know about this full and satisfying life and what it looks like is that He initiates it and He sustains it. He calls and He leads. And that's what makes life so rich. If you know Him, you know what I'm talking about. You know the beauty of His creation and sitting in intimate conversation with Him there. Or you know just the the quietness. Or you know the the still small voice when He says, you're mine. You know that old hymn in the garden, I come to the garden alone. Remember those words? He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. You know that? You know that kind of intimacy and relationship with with Jesus? Because He calls us into that relationship. And He leads us as a shepherd. A lead sheep. Remember? As He calls them out of that sheepfold, He's going to show them the way. And all the sheep do, and this is the second part, the sheep follow His voice. And they receive that gift of a rich and satisfying life. 
They follow His voice. We follow His voice and receive His gifts. So how do we do that? How do we follow His voice? Well, we go back just a second. Let's just talk a moment about how God speaks. Because this is real key to our, our walk with Him, our Christian faith. How does God speak? When was the last time you heard God speak? The Scripture says in, in John 8, 47, He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you don't hear is that you don't belong to God. So if you belong to God and you claim to belong to God, you ought to hear God speak. How does He speak? Four primary ways, Henry Blackby says. Through the Scripture. Through the church. Through circumstances. And through prayer. Look what he says. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible. That's why we call it His Word. You, you think about the Bible and you think how complex it is and how difficult it is. Well, start, start with the Gospel of John. And you'll hear it, begin to hear His voice and you begin to discern what He talks like and how He, he talks specifically to you. It's not just a religious activity. How do you follow Him? You spend time with Him every day in His Word, listening to His voice and communicating with Him in your voice through prayer. And He speaks back to you as He impresses upon you the things He wants you to do and who He wants you to be. Through the circumstances of life, you see some things. Why did this happen or this happen? And oftentimes we see that in hindsight. How God has led us. Our testimony would testify. We didn't know it at the time. We were heartbroken at the time. But God used whatever it was to draw us. Oftentimes it's suffering and difficulty. There are not good things about death and divorce and disease and all sorts of suffering and negativity. But God uses those things most certainly to speak to us and reveal Himself. His purposes. His ways. Can you share a story like that? You know some things that God has used in your life to draw Him closer, ever closer to you. Because as you walk with Him and you follow Him, you understand what the full and rich and satisfying and meaningful life really is all about. And you receive that gift. This week I had the opportunity to share uh, with another VBS uh, the gospel presentation. Uh, Ashley Webb over at First Baptist Seagraves asked me to come over and do that with the VBS at First Baptist Seagraves this week. And I, I was reminded uh, it's the same message no matter where we communicate it. It's the same way that we, we walk with the Lord and we uh, follow His steps and we receive His gift. It's this simple path. I call it in the Scripture would, would bear out this path. It's the Roman road. We know we've all blown it. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We know the price for that. The wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know that God demonstrated His love for us in this while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts God raised Him from the dead, we'll be saved. We'll be safe. We'll be whole. We'll be in right relationship with God. For it is with the heart that you believe and are made right with God, justified. And it's with the mouth that you confess and are saved. So today I want to give you the opportunity. If you don't know Jesus as your shepherd, 
as your personal, intimate leader. You don't follow Him and walk with Him, you can starting today. And if you do, if you know Him, isn't it time to listen for His voice again and follow Him? And if you're listening, isn't it time to continue to, to share in this overflowing, rich, and satisfying life? The goodness, the goodness of God. Father, thank You for these folks. Thank You for the time that we have together in Your Word. Lord, we ask that You would uh, break down any barriers right now that keep people from faith in You. That You tear down the strongholds of the evil one, of the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and that You would unite Your people around Your mission, Your cause. The reason You came, Jesus, to seek and to save those who are lost, to give us abundant life, to serve and not be served, to give your life a ransom for all us sheep. Father, we can't receive your gift because we're brilliant sheep. We can't receive your gift because we're beautiful sheep. We don't receive your gift because somehow, some way, we're, we're hard-working, faithful, steady sheep. We just got to receive your gift by grace. And we ask you, Lord, as you've saved our soul by grace, that we dispense that grace to other folks who so need it. In your holy name we pray, Jesus.